Hello all, in this lesson we're going to be studying periodic wave phenomena, uh, including wave fronts, the Doppler effect, interference, standing waves, and diffraction. The bookwork is listed here, of course we'll do that in class. Our aim in this lesson is to understand how do periodic waves behave, and these are your two do not questions. Give them a sketch for those diagrams and copy down the question before class. So wave fronts are these concentric circles of um, crests that are radiating outward from a point source. So if you have like a vibrating particle right here, it's gonna send these wave fronts outward from the circle. This animation won't play, but I have a video you can watch here. So one of the things that you'll notice is that as this object is vibrating, it is sending these concentric circle waves outwards from the center and that's what we call a wave front. I think it's easy to identify wave fronts because you can find these sort of areas of condensation in the medium. And the wavelength will just be the distance in meters between two adjacent wave fronts. So here's a wave front and there's a wave front, so the distance in meters between these two things would be the wavelength. So you may have heard the word Doppler when you were watching the weather forecast because we'll use Doppler radar for that. And we'll also use the Doppler effect in, um, for radar guns for determining like a, the speed of an oncoming car. And this is how it works. It basically just relies on wave fronts. Now if the, if the source of the waves is stationary, like this guy, then all the waves will be concentric circles all the way around and persons A and B would experience the wave fronts with the same frequency. So that's like actually not the Doppler effect. The Doppler effect would be this scenario where the source of the wave fronts is moving, let's say towards person C. So that's why you see position one, two, three, four. And at position one, it's gonna send out a wave front like this guy, but at position four, it sends out a newer wave front and what you can see is that the wave fronts get bunched up in the direction that the source is moving. So that means that the person who's observing the waves at C is really observing a much higher frequency of wave fronts than the person who's observing the waves at D. The Doppler effect. In Sheldon's words, It's the apparent change in the frequency of a wave caused by relative motion between the source of the wave and the observer. The Doppler effect is perhaps best explained visually. So here's a thing that is emitting waves. It could be a fire truck emitting sound, it could be a star emitting light, it could be a duck creating ripples on a pond. Those are all waves, and they all look something like this. We see the Doppler effect happening when the thing that is emitting waves moves. In the direction it's moving, the wave fronts bunch up, and behind it, they spread out. If our object is moving towards a stationary observer, these bunched up waves are observed at a high frequency. And if the object is moving away from a stationary observer, the waves are observed at a lower frequency. So that is the Doppler effect, the apparent change in the frequency of a wave caused by relative motion between the source of the wave and the observer. It makes sense, but it gets interesting when you consider some of its applications. So let's say you are standing in the middle of a road. That's, that's you. And a car drives past you very fast. As it does so, it honks its horn, because you're standing in the middle of the road. The horn to you might sound something like this. So it starts at a high pitch and moves to a lower pitch, even though from the driver's perspective, the horn is playing the same pitch the entire time. So what's going on? As the vehicle's coming towards you, the sound waves that it's emitting bunch up, and so are delivered to you at a higher frequency, which you interpret as a higher pitch, because the frequency of sound waves is pitch. And then when the vehicle passes you and is moving away from you, the sound waves spread out, and so you hear them at a lower frequency, a lower pitch. So that's how the Doppler effect works with sound. It also affects another kind of wave, light. So let's say you look at your observatory and you see a star. Just like the car's sound waves, if the star is moving towards you, even if it's a little bit, the light waves that it emits will be bunched up, meaning that you see the light at a higher frequency than it actually is. Frequency in sound is pitch, so what does it mean for light? 
Well, if we look at our handy pocket electromagnetic spectrum chart, we'll see that a small change in frequency for visible light will change its color. Higher frequency light waves means bluer light, and lower frequency light waves means redder light. This is called redshift, and it may possibly be among the weirdest and coolest things of all time. Stars, or anything that you can see, change color depending on their relative motion to you. Of course, you can't see this minute difference with your eyes, but astronomers with the right equipment can use this effect to tell whether stars are moving away from or towards Earth. As it turns out, almost everything we can see in the universe is moving away from us very quickly, which is both an important piece of evidence for the Big Bang and an indication that the Earth might get very lonely in the distant, distant future. So, in summary, the Doppler effect can change the apparent frequency of waves if the source of the waves is approaching or receding from the observer. Um, in short, if the source of the waves is approaching the observer, there will be an apparent shift in the change in frequency that makes it seem larger than it actually is. And if the source of the waves is receding from the observer, then the observed frequency would be lower than it actually is. Um, this might affect certain changes in the speed of the wave as well. Um, for instance, if you are this person, person C, and the wave is coming towards you, you basically have the speed of the wave plus the speed of the observer, or the speed of the source. So the speed is going to be shifted slightly up for um, the approaching wave, and for the receding waves, then it's going to be shifted slightly down. The wavelength is going to be, um, it's inverse to frequency, so you're going to see an apparent decrease in wavelength for the approach and an apparent increase in wavelength for the recession. So in short, how does Doppler effect alter sound waves? Well, um, approaching the observer would be higher pitch, higher pitch, and receding from the observer would be lower pitch. But how does this affect light? If the source of the light is approaching the observer, you're going to notice an apparent increase in the frequency of the light, which means that the light would be more blue. So we say blue shift. Now, if the source of the light is receding from the observer, there will be an apparent decrease in the frequency of the light observed, and that's going to alter the light to make it a red shift. So there you have it. That's how we use Doppler effect in physics. So for the next few slides, we're going to begin to discuss interference and the principles of superposition. Uh, I'll highlight this here. And the principle of superposition basically just says that you can algebraically sum the two, any, any two waves that are interacting in a medium. Um, some of this is pretty easy to understand. Like, for instance, if you see this wave up here and this wave, they are in phase with each other, meaning crests are on top of crests and troughs are on top of troughs. This is really cool to make something called constructive interference, where these two crests will simply add together to make a crest that's twice as large, and these two troughs would add together to make a trough that was twice as large. It's constructive interference because the two waves are sort of adding to each other's properties. Now, destructive interference is when two waves are completely out of phase, like 180 degrees out of phase, and that means that let's say a crest is um, lined up against a trough, then those two will algebraically sum as well. But it, let's say that this crest has an amplitude of positive 1, and this trough has an amplitude of negative 1. Positive 1 and negative 1 are going to add to 0, which is why you're going to see a resultant wave, which is just a 0 amplitude. And if you go to the next um, sort of part of the wave, we have trough lined up against crest. Again, that's 180 degrees out of part. 180 degrees out of phase, so you have a zero degree algebraic sum, and you're going to see that across the whole wave, and this is going to be complete destructive interference. So to summarize what was just discussed, constructive interference occurs when you have two waves that are in phase with each other, so the phase difference is zero, and uh, destructive interference happens when the phase difference is actually 180. And there are two more vocab words I want to share with you before we go to the next slide, and those are antinodes and nodes. So an antinode is a place where you have this maximum displacement. And an example of an antinode could be here, 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 or there. So those are the maximum displacements. Um, now a node is when you have um, basically these regions of zero displacement, 
and you can find nodes all along that wave. And at certain points along, you know, the constructive interference, you'll find nodes as well. I'll do those in red. So I wish I could do a better job, but the nodes are there sort of along that equilibrium line. All right, so here are a couple of visuals to help us understand constructive and destructive interference. Okay, let's start with the first example. And the two blue waves are um, given the chance to superpose at one point in time. And since those two crests are moving in the same direction, you do get some constructive interference right there. And um, you can see that the height of the crest of the red wave is about twice the height of the crest of the blue wave. So let's call this constructive interference and then look at the next one. So the next guy is going to be two blue waves that are interacting, but they're in opposite directions. So the red wave is sort of like their resultant, and you can see that there is this interesting moment as the two waves superpose when the two crests drop to a displacement of zero, um, thereby creating a node. And during that node, there is no displacement. It's there. Well, it's more like here. Got it. All right, so there's our node. And I'll also mark the anti-node in constructive interference as well, but this one's destructive interference. So my last note before I leave this slide is the way I remember node and anti-node, because they're so similar, those two words. But um, I think of node as meaning no displacement, node, no displacement. And um, that's obviously what's happening right here at the node, is you have no displacement at the superposition. And an anti-node would be the opposite of a node, so it would be, you know, maximum displacement. So standing waves are one of my all-time favorites, and basically it's what's happening is you have these two waves, and the two waves have the same amplitude and the same frequency, and when that happens and they're traveling in the same medium, you can get this thing called a standing wave. Um, in a fixed diagram, it looks like this, where you have basically this one long crest, which is just inverting itself and making a trough. But you can have more than one repetition. So you could have two crests inverting to be troughs, or you could have three crests inverting as troughs, or four crests inverting as troughs. And um, there are a series of nodes and anti-nodes in these. You have, um, at the very least, you have two nodes on the ends and one anti-node in the middle. But you can have far more than that. You can have a... Um, two nodes on the ends plus two more and another one. So that one has a total of five nodes and it has, let's see, one, two, three, four anti-nodes. So that's all well and good, but let me show you an animation to help clarify this. So the two waves at the top are the two waves that are interacting. They have the same amplitude, they're traveling in the same medium. They do happen to be traveling in opposite directions, however. And there are moments when crests are lining up with crests and creating these very strong areas of maximum displacement. You can see those here. Uh, yeah. So right now what you've got is two crests lined up against each other, so you have this really wonderful anti-node. And down here, you have two crosses lined up with each other, two troughs lined up with each other, so you have this wonderful um, anti-node down here as well. And of course, this is a node, an area of node displacement. Um, and let's see if we can maximize that by going forward a little bit. So I just passed one, and it's right there. And in this particular scenario where you have a beautiful trough lined up with a beautiful crest, you get no displacement. But you're going to get that here as well. And in fact, you'll get that at every point along the entire waveform. And when that happens, you have this really awesome, complete node throughout the whole wave. So these two waves are completely canceling each other out, um, which is this awesome moment that happens during every standing wave. But um, it just oscillates back and forth. So you get these complete nodes to like these really beautiful anti-nodes and this, the wave appears to be not moving at all, but just sort of like vibrating up and down like this. And so I think that's really cool. 
All right, so let's get rid of this and um, make sure that we have everything that we need. Um, I guess the only thing I'll add here is that there is a certain defined distance between successive nodes, and the distance between two successive nodes is always going to be half of a wavelength. Check it out up here. So basically, like, if you look at the first example, here's a node, here's a node. This distance is defined as half of a wavelength because you can see that this is only half of a cycle, so the whole cycle would, go, would continue and sort of end up here, just like a sine wave. Um, here's a complete wavelength, so you get um, there's one cycle, here's another cycle, and you have two nodes, one here and one here, and that's, of course, half a wavelength. You will can see that process continue at these um, larger number of nodes diagrams. Resonance is also one of my favorites. Um, basically, let's say that you are a monkey and you're like poking a ball that's on a string, like you're poking a pendulum. Now, the pendulum has its own frequency that it likes to oscillate at. And if the, if the monkey can um, poke that pendulum with the same frequency that the pendulum likes to uh, oscillate, then he can really increase the swing and he can do something called resonance, where he makes the amplitude get larger with every moment. But if he's poking it randomly and not according to the natural frequency at which the pendulum oscillates, then it's not going to create resonance. Here's an animation to help us understand. All right, so we have this monkey. He's poking the ball, and it does look like his pokes match the natural frequency of the pendulum. And that's why the amplitude at, at certain points will get out of control, and it will knock the, freq or knock the monkey backwards because he increased the amplitude so much. Let's try another example where his pokes do not match the natural frequency. So now we have the monkey who's sort of poking at his own pace. It's not matching the frequency of the, of the pendulum. And you can see that quickly the pendulum loses all of its momentum and it just sort of sits still. So he did not achieve resonance in this case. So pushing a friend on a swing is also an example of resonance because the swing has its own natural frequency at which it vibrates. And with your pushes, if you can match that frequency, then you can increase the amplitude of the swings, and that's what we call resonance. You can also do this with tuning forks, and um, I have some tuning forks at school, so if we have a moment and you guys are curious, ask me to get them out and we'll see if I can make resonance happen with tuning forks. On this slide, I have a couple more examples of resonance I want you to see, one of them involving this classic example of how to break a wine glass using only sound, and the other one involves the Tacoma Narrows Bridge in Washington. You may have seen footage of this before, but I'm going to show it to you today if you haven't. So first, let's check out the wine glass. failed. It could no longer handle the uh, amplitude of the oscillations and it just shattered. So let's get rid of this and check out the Tacoma Narrows Bridge footage. So this is actual footage from a day when there was some sort of moderate wind coming down the gorge in Washington. And it caused this really ridiculous, very dramatic oscillation in the bridge. So you have to imagine that the way the bridge is built, it gives it this natural frequency at which it vibrates. And um, back in this time period, we would make bridges super flexible on purpose so that they could withstand, let's say, earthquakes and high winds and things like that. But what was not being wondered about here was what would happen if it was so flexible that it matched the frequency of the winds gusts that were coming in. So on this particular day, those frequencies matched, the resonance went out of control, and the amplitude of the oscillations went out of control, and this happened. Um, 
the bridge did fail. Um, it did collapse into the gorge, and um, I don't have footage of that. But it it was rebuilt, and what they did differently to make it better was they actually stiffened the bridge so that it was less flexible and less prone to problems with resonance. So diffraction is another property of periodic waves that I want you guys to be familiar with. And um, basically, if you have a wave and it encounters a barrier, it doesn't necessarily just stop at the barrier. It has options for what it can do. So for instance, if this is a barrier with just a tiny opening right here, one of the things we noticed is that the waves will approach the barrier and then they'll spread behind the barrier um, in this circular pattern. If you make the, make the um, opening larger in the barrier, the waves will still pass through, but you're going to notice less circular patterns and less spreading of the wave around the barrier. Um, so this is called diffraction, the circular bending of the wave. And strictly speaking, um, diffraction is just defined as the spreading of waves into the region behind the barrier. And it works best when the wavelength of the waves, which you can see here as the distance between wave fronts. Um, diffraction works best when the wavelength of the wave is similar in size to the opening in the barrier. Um, one of the problems in this scenario was that here's the wavelength of the waves, they're um, maybe a centimeter apart, and the opening itself is actually much wider than that, so the diffraction effects are not as noticeable. All right, so with that, we have reached the pair up. Of course, I will make copies of these for you. And these. And these. And here is your summary. But I do need you to copy these down, so make sure that you copy these down before class starts, and we'll work on these together in class next time I see you.